Hello Internet, welcome to my channel. I'm Chameleon X, and today we're diving back into the post-nuclear wasteland of Fallout. A while ago, I made a video about how to use house rules and homebrew to emulate the flavor and mechanics of the Fallout series using the 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons rule set. At the time, I mentioned I would make a dedicated video addressing the equipment of the Fallout series and how to model the game's various items in the D20 system. Well, obviously, that video kind of slipped my mind, but thanks to a helpful comment, I am now back on track. In the time between that video and this one, there's been a few developments in the TTRPG space that have prompted many creators, myself included, to take a step back and rethink our approach. Though I still love D&D 5e, and it's the rule set I'm most familiar with, those who followed the channel will know I've been looking to expand the scope of my content in light of certain... <clears throat> events. As such, this video will not just cover D&D 5e, but will also provide advice for how to include Fallout-themed equipment in other game systems that I've been looking at getting into. As I haven't had much of a chance to play any of these other systems, I'll be going solely off White Room Theory Crafting, so if anyone with experience in these alternate systems spots anything obviously broken, please mention it in the comments. So without further ado, let's get into it. Now, since we're talking about basing a tabletop role-playing game on the world of Fallout, it's probably a pretty obvious move to start with the actual official Fallout TTRPG released by Modifius a few years ago. This game is based on a 2d20 system where the outcome of actions is determined by rolling two 20-sided dice against a target number, which in this case is determined by your character's special stat plus your rank and the skill associated with whatever you're trying to do. This includes attacks, since the game includes weapon skills from Fallout, like big guns, throwing, energy weapons, and unarmed. Each d20 that lands at or below the target number is counted as a success, and each task has a difficulty level that requires you to get a certain number of successes to pass the check. You can spend action points to buy extra d20s for your roll, increasing your chances of success, and any successes you get over the number required to pass are converted into action points you can spend later. The core rulebook for Modifius's Fallout RPG is very obviously centered around the Commonwealth of Fallout 4, and pretty much everything in it comes from that game. The armor, weapons, modding system, power armor, and so forth are all ripped straight from Fallout 4, Fallout 4 not including the DLC content. Modifius has, however, recently released a major expansion to the game called the Settler's Guidebook, which adds a ton of new content, including equipment. I haven't been able to get my hands on it yet, but I would guess that they're adding this stuff from Automatron and Nuka World, and possibly Fallout 76. In addition, Modifius plans on releasing another expansion later this year centered around the West Coast, and including the Mojave Wasteland, so it's a good bet that some more stuff from Fallout New Vegas will be added to the game soon. I haven't been able to play this myself, but a little research online reveals the game has some promise, but much like Bethesda's own work, it's been plagued by a bunch of mismanagement, janky systems, and rush development. There is a significant community of homebrewers adding content to the game, though, so if you'd like to check this system out and see if it's right for you, I'll include a link to the official website where you can order the rulebooks. Now, when I made my original Fallout conversion into 5e d and a lot of the decisions I made were based on simplicity. I'd already scheduled a time to start the Fallout adventure I'd planned, and the rules had to be finished fast enough for my players to build their characters, and for me to finish designing at least the first session. So I went about my conversion with the goal of sticking as close to the existing rules as I could, while still going for the flavor of the Fallout series. It's for this reason that when it came to armor, I pretty much just copied the table from the 5e player's handbook and slotted in Fallout armor instead. The only real change I made to this system was adding in a column for damage threshold. Every time you take damage, your DT is subtracted from the damage before adding resistance or vulnerability. Each armor has a separate value for physical and energy damage, and I tried to balance each armor type's AC and DT so that the choice of armor was less obvious. You could have a legitimate reason, for instance, to choose an armor with a lower AC bonus but higher damage threshold. The other major change I made to armor in my original rules conversion was regarding power armor. Going off the version in Fallout 4, I presented power armor as clearly superior to all other forms of armor, but it requires a fusion core to function. In retrospect, I probably should have added a bit more restrictions to this list to balance it out against traditional armor, especially when the fusion core is depleted. 
perhaps disadvantage on all ability checks using dexterity, the inability to do anything requiring fine motor skills, and perhaps a penalty to pass or perception as a result of being in a big clunky suit with limited visibility. Once the core is depleted, you should probably also have disadvantage on all ability checks and saving throws using strength or dexterity. In my original rules, I had a fusion core last for about 10 hours of continuous operation, but you can tweak the exact duration to whatever you think is best for your game. Now, if I were to do this all over again, I might take a more in-depth approach. Fallout 4 and 76 are the only games in the Fallout series that separate armor into discrete pieces like legs, armor, and torso, etc. So the method I used is consistent for the prior games in the series. If one wanted to go for the modular approach, however, you could divide the various types of armor on this list into right and left arms and legs and torso armor. If we look at the description of the various armor types in the player's handbook for 5th edition, we can see that the defensive value of each type of armor seems to have some correlation between how much of the body is covered. For example, a chain shirt gives you AC 13, while chainmail is AC 16. The description for both armor sets is almost identical, except that chainmail specifically calls out that the suit includes gauntlets and thicker padding underneath. This implies that the chain shirt itself is supplying the 13 AC, and the extra three points, therefore, are coming from the gauntlets and arming doublet, and perhaps maybe also a coif. Oh, this last one isn't called out by the description, but it seems fairly logical and it helps make the math work out. Likewise, a breastplate gives you an AC of 14, while half plate gives you an AC of 15. The main difference in the description is that the later adds some mi minor lag protection in the form of greaves, while the former explicitly has no protection for the arms or legs. Full plate armor with an AC of 18 includes the breastplate and also specifically includes gauntlets, heavy leather boots, and a visored helmet. We can thus surmise that a breastplate, in and of itself, adds 14 to our AC, greaves or boots add 1, gauntlets add 1, and a helmet adds 1. The description for plate armor, like chainmail, also specifically mentions a heavy arming doublet being worn under the armor, which would provide the extra plus 1. So then... It seems like the majority of our AC should come from the cuirass, which makes perfect sense. Especially thick padding underneath the armor would give us an extra plus one. This could correspond to a vault suit, road leathers, a leather jacket, long johns, a brotherhood jumpsuit, or any other sort of fallout-themed apparel that could add some modicum of protection. From there, arm protection, leg protection, and a helmet would each provide a plus one to AC. With this modular system, we end up with something pretty similar mathematically to what we got previously, but with the benefit of greater customization. The Pathfinder 2 E system is a little more difficult to divide in the same way as we did before because of the way it standardizes armor across the board. Almost all forms of armor, apart from the heaviest, gives you a total of AC 15, splitting this between the armor bonus and your dex bonus. In general, your dex bonus decreases in direct proportion to your AC bonus from the armor itself, so it always ends up adding up to 15, provided you have enough dexterity to get to the maximum bonus. There are some exceptions. Really heavy armor like full plate gets you up to AC 16, and some really low tier armor is AC 14, but by and large the pattern is consistent. So the basic approach would be to just do what we did for 5e and import the various armor types from Fallout into the Pathfinder 2 system, like so. If we wanted to go the piecemeal route, though, it's going to require a little bit more work. Just like with 5e, we can look at the armor descriptions to get a basic idea of where these numbers are coming from. A suit of leather armor grants us a plus 1 to AC and has a dex cap of 4. Brigandine bumps this up to 2 AC and a plus 3 dex, with the only stated difference being the metal plates sewn into the stitching. And this has the same stats as the chain shirt, which is stated as providing minor protection to the upper arms and thighs. A full suit of chainmail, on the other hand, doubles this to AC4 and plus 1 dex, and the description states that the armor includes a chain shirt, leggings, arms, and a coif. This would seem to imply that by covering the rest of the arms and legs and adding a helmet, we could get an extra 2 AC. We see a similar story with the breastplate, which has the same stats as chainmail. In the description, we see that the breastplate includes the cuirass and sometimes protection for the hips and lower legs. Moving up to half plate, we can see the armor bonus has once again increased by 1, with the description now explicitly mentioning sparse protection for the arms and legs. 
Then we have full plate, which, which is the best armor you can get. Are we seeing a pattern here? Luckily, yes. Yes, we are. So, what it seems is going on here is that just like in 5e, most of your armor bonus is coming from the Quirus. Much like our 5e example, then, we can surmise that adding full protection for both arms and both legs adds up to plus 1 AC, with the partial coverage being half a point. A helmet would further add plus 1 AC. So what we end up with is something like this. The Curus can provide as much as a plus 3 bonus to AC, with a helmet adding plus 1, and each arm or leg piece contributing a 0.5. Though equipping just one arm or leg piece without the matching set wouldn't provide a numerical bonus, if these pieces have any legendary effects or other properties, it could still be worth it. For power armor, the simplest way to do this would probably be to treat it like magic plate armor with a bunch of special properties, as shown here. If you want to split them up into pieces, I'd say have the AC bonus be divided among the armor pieces, just like with normal plate, and then have a power armor chassis that, that adds all the other effects. So hypothetically, if the player finds just an empty frame, they would get all the bonuses of wearing power armor, but with no AC bonus. If you do split up the pieces, I would have the runes be a set bonus you only get with a full suit, with the potency based on the precise arrangement of armor parts. Now, one feature of the Fallout 2D20 game that I didn't think to add in either my 5e conversion or Pathfinder rules is rad resistance. In Fallout 4, the, and therefore in the TTRPG version, different pieces of apparel offer resistance to radiation in varying amounts. In the TTRPG, there is no traditional armor that provides rad resistance, only power armor and select pieces of clothing such as the vault suit, brotherhood fatigues, and of course, the hazmat suit. For 5e, you can either have these pieces grant resistance or a flat damage reduction similar to ballistic and energy damage. In Pathfinder, all damage resistance is a specific value, so that's already covered. The way I did weapons for my campaign was much like the way I did armor. I simply looked at the weapons table in the player's handbook and slotted in various armaments from the Fallout series. As should come as no surprise, I relied pretty heavily on the DMG's Dungeon Master Toolkit chapter, and specifically ex its examples of firearms and explosives. As in the book, the guns on this table are pretty overpowered compared to what a standard game of D&D would have, with even a 10mm pistol having the potential to instantly kill a first-level character on a critical hit. This is one reason I made sure to add damage thresholds to the game, since it helps make the game slightly less deadly. Even so, getting shot with pretty much any gun in the early game is potentially lethal, as it probably should be. If you want to simplify things, you can just bump these weapon damages down to more reasonable values and then just strip DT from the game, or hell, just keep the damage high, cut out resistance, and turn the game into rocket tag. It's up to you. Now, a second slightly more complicated but more modular system would be to disassociate weapon damage from the gun itself and put it on the ammunition. In this model, the other stats of the semi-automatic pistol would be the same as on this table, but the damage would be based on the type of ammo it was chambered for, 38 cal, 9 mil, 10 millimeter, and so forth. Note that the values on the table don't necessarily match the ones on the previous table. These are just examples of how you might hash them out. Exactly how much a particular gun deals per attack should also factor in its fire rate and other various details like whether it throws multiple projectiles like a shotgun or deals damage over time like a flamer, etc. An assault rifle chambered in 5mm ammo, for instance, could do a total of 3d4 ballistic damage per attack on the assumption that each shot is actually a three-round burst. A shotgun that's fired in blast mode could deal an extra die of damage to represent the fact that there are multiple pellets being fired at once, and so on. This is faster and more balanced within the action economy of 5th edition than actually adding extra attacks for automatic weapons, as such an approach could quickly bog down the game and lead to other headaches at the table. One thing I considered adding but didn't, but which is included in Fallout 2D20 rules, is the concept of pipe weapons being unreliable compared to other firearms. In Modifius's RPG, pipe weapons have a higher chance of breaking or jamming when you roll a complication which is that system's equivalent of a critical failure. If you want to add this in, you can have the weapon jam or misfire if the player rolls a nat 1, requiring an action to clear the problem before it can be fired again. I didn't do this because pipe weapons are already garbage, so adding just another reason to never use them seemed like overkill to me. When it comes to Pathfinder 2e, the conversion is a lot easier since the game already includes firearms added into its core rules, 
and the multiple actions make automatic weapons easier to manage in the action economy of the game compared to 5e. Pathfinder also has a number of traits like kickback, scatter, and volley, which are very appropriate for firearms. And there's even a cobbled trait that would be appropriate to add to pipe weapons. Almost all guns in Pathfinder seem to have the fatal and concussive trait as well, the former indicating that a critical hit with a gun is pretty much guaranteed to deal massive damage. Concussive seems to be how Pathfinder deals with ballistic damage. It's like a combination of bludgeoning and piercing. You have to have resistance to both damage types or else you take full damage from a bullet. Just resistance to piercing or bludgeoning damage alone isn't enough. Pathfinder also gives its firearms more normalized damage values instead of the inflated dice of 5th edition. As a result, you can probably get away with just ignoring damage threshold if you're playing a game of Fallout and Pathfinder 2. Just use the damage die values I included in the ammunition table instead of the weapons table and you should be good to go. Just add the traits you think are most appropriate to each weapon and you should have a fairly easy time converting these weapons to Paizo's system. In the Fallout 2D20 game, Modifius goes to impressive lengths to stat out a huge variety of food and drink items from Fallout 4, from pre-war box dinners to craftable meals to Nuka-Cola and beyond. With very few exceptions, these cons consumables have the same basic effect that they do in the video game, albeit ba balanced around the mechanics of the tabletop rules. In my Fallout conversion, I did pretty much the opposite. I gave very little consideration for food and drink, just shoving a few items into a miscellaneous goods and services table at the end of my player's guide. I don't think I ever seriously thought about making a large list, partially because I was pressed for time, but also because the idea of food and drink recovering HP seemed a bit weird in the context of a game like D&D. As it stands, I'm not quite sure how much of an effect it would have on game balance to have food and drink be legit consumable items on par with magic potions or scrolls. On the one hand, it might break immersion a bit to be able to scarf down a plate of Deathclaw steak and suddenly your gaping wounds seal up and you stop bleeding to death. On the other hand, hit points are already an abstraction in the game and finding interesting and potentially powerful consumable items would give a good incentive to explore the environment and provide war rewards that are more manageable from a GM perspective. In the grand scheme of things, it makes about as much sense for an ice-cold coke to save you from a bullet wound as it does jabbing whatever a stim pack is into your arm and having all your broken bones mend instantaneously. At the end of the day, it's about whether or not it makes the game fun to play. So, for the sake of brevity, I would recommend just poaching the list directly from the Modifius game and just tweaking the details to suit your preferred system. It's way easier than just then pulling up the Fallout wiki and going line by line, converting every specific dish. And if you did that, you'd end up with more or less the same result anyway. In 5e, numerical bonuses can either grant advantage on a check or lower the DC for the check. While in Pathfinder, the effects from the 2d20 version are probably fine as is for, most, for the most part. You just have to switch around the language a bit in some cases and maybe replace an effect or two where there isn't a one-to-one -one match on mechanics. When it comes to chems, I did go through and list out most of the major ones I could remember. Most of the effects are pretty straightforward, and though I designed them for the 5th edition rule set, it's pretty easy to just replace advantage and disadvantage with a plus 2 or minus 2 if you want to convert these to Pathfinder. The system Modifius used in their game ended up pretty similar to mine, which isn't surprising since we're using the same source material. The main difference is how addiction works. In my rules, I simply had the player roll a con save against disease versus a static DC every time they used a chem. In the D20 system, you roll a number of dice equal to the number of doses you've taken that session and compare the number of ones you rolled to the addiction chance. Either way, though, the effects of addiction are roughly the same. It just reverses the benefit the drug gives you whenever you're not high. So if you're addicted to buff out, a chem that boosts your strength and con, your strength and con is penalized while you're not under the effects of buff out. Pretty simple stuff. I also threw in a few random items at the end, like stealth boys, a Geiger counter, doctor's bags and stuff, which I now realize that I never actually got around to writing rules for, so I'm going to do that now. The link to my Fallout conversion rules, which I've updated for this video, will be in the description. Another major thing that I never got around to adding to my rules due to time constraints, it was mods for weapons, armor, and gear. 
Though this aspect of gameplay is most central to Fallout 4 and 76, modding equipment has been present in most of the Fallout games. Both of the original Fallouts, for instance, allowed the player to upgrade their plasma rifle via a certain NPC, and in Fallout New Vegas, weapon mods were also an important mechanic to consider. The 3D games, bobbleheads, magazines, and cybernetic implants could also be considered a sort of mod, though affecting the player character instead of their gear. So, how would we incorporate modding equipment into our rules without destroying the balance of the game? The way I chose to handle it in my original conversion was to not really address it directly. I did mention a crafting skill that could be used to repair and modify equipment and laid out a few basic rules for how to handle it. However, I left the details of what mods existed and how they should be implemented to the GM. So, basically me. I chose to do it this way not only because it saved me the time of writing up extensive lists of all the possible mods for every gun or piece of armor, the way Modifius did, and also because it gave more creative freedom and ingenuity to the players to come up with possible ways of crafting and modifying their own gear. Like, for instance, crafting a giant pair of scissors, or building a, a makeshift missile out of length of pipe gunpowder in a frag mine. Which approach you want to use largely depends on how good you are at improv and whether or not you want to encourage your players to come up with absurd combinations of in-game armaments that makes the Dead Rising fr franchise look quaint by comparison. When your players start asking if their character can see any of a strangely specific kind of object just laying around, you can be pretty sure they're planning on duct taping that object to something else and killing things with it. But, as I mentioned above, the Fallout 2D20 game does include a meticulous list of mods for various weapons and armor, each with their own associated rules and components. If you want to impose some order on modding in your game, but don't want to dive in and start from scratch, you could take a look at the list Modifius compiled and convert the mechanics to your preferred system in the same way you did for armor and weapons. Most of them have pretty straightforward effects that shouldn't be too hard to implement in whichever rule set you're using. A related concept to mods, all of the modern Fallout games feature unique and or rare pieces of equipment with special properties, usually as quest rewards or loot hidden in out-of-the-way places to reward exploration. Or, if you're boring, you can just let the player buy them for an absurd amount of caps. Anyway, it should go without saying that most fantasy-based TPTRPGs like D&D and Pathfinder already have a system in place for these kind of items, Magic weapons and armor are a staple of these games, so it should be fairly easy to slot in the concept of unique weapons. If you consider some of the legendary effects available for Fallout 4 and 76, a lot of that stuff is pretty close to being the kind of things you would expect a magic item to do. Fallout 76 also added multi-star legendaries to the game, which fits quite nicely into the rarity system of magic items in 5e and Pathfinder. For your convenience, I've gone ahead and converted some legendary effects from Fallout 4 and 76, just an as an example of how these could be modeled in a TTRPG. You could just slap one or more of these on a weapon from the tables I mentioned earlier, and there's your unique weapon. Well, that's it for this one. If you liked my take on this subject, don't hesitate to like, subscribe, and comment. If there's anything else you wanted me to cover, or anything you think I missed or got wrong, let me know below. War never changes, but the YouTube algorithm certainly does. Until next time, I've been Chameleon X, preparing you for a better life. Underground!